while he's getting things together. I just wanted to uh, let you all know, I think we're going to start getting in. You got it? All right. Uh, I think we're going to go back to some Wednesday night services for anybody that would like to uh, come on Wednesday nights, but it's going to be a little different. It's going to be a lot different. How many of y'all have ever read the Bible all the way through? All the way through, front to back. All right, all right. Amen. Amen. We're going to do a Bible reading for the next year. And we're going to read through the Bible together as a group. I know a lot of times it's hard to open your Bibles and just dig in and, and read word for word what God says to us. It's really hard to do that sometimes. Uh, this is going to be a little different. I have no idea where God's taking it. I have no idea where we're going to go with it. But we're going to read the Bible on Wednesday nights. All right. And we're going to talk about it. So come with questions. Come with answers. I got questions. I'm the pastor, but I got questions just like everybody else, you know, and, and we're going to read it and we're going to talk about it. And uh, I, I, like I said, I don't have a clue what's going to happen. I don't know where God's taking it, but I hope that if you've never read the Bible, and for those of you who have, we'll come on Wednesday nights and just, just kind of join in. And, and uh, we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation. And it may take us a year. Or, you know me. It may take us five. <laughs> but, but we're going to go, you know. I'm, I'm not going to pre-study. I'm not going to write nothing down. The only thing I'm going to do is actually read. Just like y'all, so read ahead of time if you can. What you can, can. And if you can't, don't. We'll read it together when we come together. So, uh, like I said, I don't know where it's going to go, but uh, pray about that. Pray that the Lord be able to talk talk to you. And, and I don't know if I'm going to do it online, so I, I, don't, I don't have a clue. Like I said, I'm just going to follow God's lead on this. And he told me that he wants us to read the Bible. So that's what we're going to do, all right? So I hope you all come out for that. Uh, so, uh, this Wednesday night, first, first time. So open your Bibles if you have them and read before we get here. All right. <laughs> if you don't, like I said, that's okay. Anyway, here we go again this, this morning, getting ready to jam into our next, uh, message in our series called following Jesus. Y'all ready? I'm not too sure I am. <laughs> This one was uh, this one was kind of tough for me, uh, mainly because I had uh, I had a whole different idea uh, of what I was going to preach about uh, two weeks ago, and I had two weeks to study and two weeks to plug in and two weeks to push forward and, and write everything, all the ideas down that God had given me, right? But God kept pushing me to something else. Uh, here I thought I had things together, and uh, we went and got that puppy yesterday. And when I got back, the Lord says, "No, nah, you ain't got nothing together. We got to go to whack to work." So at seven o'clock last night, seven o'clock, okay, <laughs> seven o'clock. Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, he did. He actually, he actually said it's not going to be this hard, Tom, because I was like, "Lord, it's seven o'clock. I'm tired." I got a new puppy. I ain't going to sleep tonight. I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, I'm not going to make it that hard. We're actually going to pull a couple old sermons out of the archive. We're going to push some things together and build a new sermon out of some old stuff that you've got. So uh, some of y'all that have been here every Sunday and heard every message, some of y'all going to hear some repeat stuff. But you know what? It ain't too bad. How many times have you watched Home Alone? Right? How many times have you watched Back to the Future? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Ghost but anything, right? Y'all have watched TV a few times over again, so it's not going to hurt you to hear the same thing a little bit. But uh, like I said, I don't, I don't even know wh wh why he had, had me do this, but I guess, you know, that's why he's God and I'm not, right? <laughs> so as we begin our next message on following Jesus, it all starts with uh, one simple uh, question. And that question is, what do you base your relationship with Jesus on? Think about that question for a minute. Don't answer it out loud. Answer it to yourself because yourself is the best critic, right? You can't lie to yourself, right? Okay, so what do you base your relationship with Jesus on? Do you base it on the fact that you love him? Or do you base it on the fact that he loves you? 
That's a really important question to ask yourself. Believe it or not, those, uh, those two things are extremely different. Okay? And this morning we're going to take a look at what that difference really means in our lives. Let's pray and get started. Lord, I come to you this morning. I'm a little nervous. I'm not really sure I did what you wanted me to, but Lord, I just pray that you, uh, you, you speak to your people the words that you want them to hear this morning, Lord. Get me out of the way. Let them only see you standing up here behind this pulpit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the message entitled... This message is entitled, uh, The One That Jesus Loved. The One That Jesus Loved. It's kind of a bold statement, isn't it? Uh, You might tell me this morning, hey, Tom, I love Jesus. And that's all well and good, right? But guess what? I'm going to tell you that I'm the one that Jesus loves. Uh. To be honest with you for a second, I don't think you'd find a whole lot of people that would actually say something like that to somebody else, right? Why? Because it's kind of rude, you know? Hey, man, I love Jesus. Yeah, but I'm the one Jesus loves. It's kind of a rude answer, right? But if we were to dig into Scripture just a little bit, we're going to find that one man uh, did just that. He did just that. He's a man that refers to himself during the middle of a dispute on who is the greatest follower of Jesus. Who's the greatest follower of Jesus? He he refers to himself, okay, as the one that Jesus loved. And he doesn't just do this once, okay? He does it at least five times that we have recorded in Scripture. You're probably thinking, Tom, that sounds a whole lot like a Pharisee, right? I mean, that's kind of how they are, right? We're, We're the ones that Jesus loves. You can't, you know, right? They were always telling everyone how great they were. But you'd be wrong. It's not a Pharisee. Anybody got an idea? Speak up. Anybody? He was actually one of Jesus' own disciples. Not really sure about that? Let's go to the replay. The man that we're talking about this morning is, the, is one of the original 12 disciples, and his name is John. John. Okay? Uh, and he even wrote one of the Gospels, right? You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John. Right, okay. This may sound to you like a man that thinks a little bit too highly of himself, okay? I mean, it did to me every single time that I read it, but as I studied it, and I studied it, and I studied it, because it just bothered me, right? It just got to me. Every time I read this, I'm like, dude, it's John, man. He is stuck on himself, right? What is What is up with all this? Things begin to take shape as I studied that I never ever saw before. And so let me help you to begin seeing the same things that I did and how that one way of thinking will help us follow Jesus and the other is just going to help us follow ourselves. Uh, You see, living off your love for Jesus alone will just end up getting yourself into a big old batch of trouble. Okay, nobody likes dealing with trouble in their life, right? I don't. I hate getting in trouble. (laughs) And so to begin breaking all this down, let's go to the first place that all of this begins happening. And that's going to be in John chapter 13, verse 23. John chapter 13 and verse 23. If you want to head that way, I'm going to do the best that I can at setting up the scene for you so that you can kind of get a good picture of what's happening. Jesus and and his boys are all up in the upper room, okay? Jesus is about to head to his crucifixion. But just but but first he's uh, having dinner with his best buddies, right? His compadres, the guys that have followed him through thick and thin, seen miracle after miracle and out of anyone they should understand the importance of today's meal, right? But the fact is, they don't know it yet, but this is the very last time that they're going to all be together before Jesus is executed, okay? And so they're all sitting around the table getting ready to fill their bellies, right? When Jesus drops a bomb, he says in verse 21, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciple, all of them, okay? Kind of in shock and in awe of what just came out of Jesus' mouth, they immediately stop everything that they're doing and they begin looking at each other. Is it me? Is it is is it me? Is is, is it you, Bill? Is it you, Chris? You know, it's got to be you, Chris, because it ain't me. 
Right? No? Bobby, is it you? And then we have Peter. Okay? Who during the middle of this disagreement, he leans over to John, who happened to just be sitting next to Jesus at the time. And here's the verse, okay? Verse 23. Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. What? How would you like to be Matthew, Mark, or Luke, right? Reading John's account of what just happened that night, right? Man, that John, he's got some nerve calling himself the one that Jesus loved, right? We're going to have to take him out behind the donkey pen later and show him who the one Jesus loves is, okay? In fact, I bet John's proofreader came running into the room after reading that part of the scripture, right? Holding John's scroll in his hand with the big part highlighted in red, and he's going, are you really sure you want to write this, right? Are you are you really sure you want to say this in this letter, right? And John seriously looks over at him and goes, you know what? Yes, that's exactly what I want to say. Okay, he says, okay, man, I guess I got some damage control to deal with. because It's going to be some damage control to have to deal with later when they read what you just said about yourself. Anyways, he says, Peter here uh, says to John, he says, dude, because, you know, that's how they talk back then. Right. Dude. Right. Dude. We all need to know who Jesus is talking about. We need to know who this is that's going to betray him, who's, who's going to do this. He says, you're sitting closer to him. Go ahead and ask him who it is. Find out who he's talking about. We, we need to know which one of us in this room is a traitor because I know it ain't me, right? That's what you just said. I know it ain't me, right? I mean, I would never do anything like that. So John, or the one Jesus loved, right? leans a little more into Jesus' breast, and he asks him, Lord, can you tell me who it is? Can you tell me who's going to be the the traitor, you know? We all need to know so we can give him a good swift kick upside the head later on after we get done eating, right? We We need to know who this is. But for now, let's keep going, okay? There it is, the first place that John refers to himself as the one Jesus loved. Now remember, this very first time that we just read, okay, and who it was he was with. Who was he with, everybody? Peter, right? John and Peter, right? That's who the two were. Because you got to really understand who these two are and what's going on in order to understand everything else. So it's important to know where he was and who he was with the very first time he did this. Uh, So let's fast forward, go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. We're going to be in verse 26. Go ahead and turn there and I'll start getting this one ready for you, okay? The traitor, who turned out to be Judas, right, has already came forward. He's already given Jesus into the hands of the enemy. Jesus is hanging on the cross and if you were to close your eyes, you can see him hanging there. He's been beaten. He's bloody. He's tired. He's fighting for his life. It's the last time that he's going to be here on this earth in this form, okay? It's almost over. He's having a really hard time even breathing. You know, they had that little thing. He had to push himself up just to get a breath of air. He's having a really hard time at this time. When he looks down from the cross and he sees his mom, right? He sees his mom standing there and standing next to her, he sees a man. He sees a man, okay? And he shakes his head just a little bit. Remember that crown of thorns that was pressed into his face, into his head? He's got drips of blood down into his eyes. He shakes his head a little bit, tries to get that blood out of his eyes, right? So that he could see who is standing there. And he sees that the man standing next to his mom is John, okay? And, and his eyes widen just a little bit as much as can be expected for a man that's in this position, okay? And the scripture says, verse 25, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, okay, here it is, all right, you ready? And the disciple whom he loved standing by, 
He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Again, John is so bold as to call himself the one that Jesus loved. Every time, man, I tell you, every time I read this uh, statement from John, it kind of baffles me just a little bit, right? Until that is that I begin to put all the little pieces of the puzzle together in order to form the bigger picture. You see, the Bible is kind of like a big puzzle sometimes, right? It's kind of like, and, and you know what? God walks in. You ever feel like that? You ever feel when you start reading the Bible, you're like, oh man, this is like a puzzle. I got to go here. You know what? God comes in, he takes this box with, you know, the 10,000 piece puzzle box and he opens the thing and he just flops it down on the table. He wants to work with you to help put that puzzle back together. Okay, he's not doing it to be mean to you. He's not saying, here it is, you figure it out. No, he wants you to stop and go, Lord, I can't do this on my own, right? He's like, man, I, I want, I, I need some help. And he wants you to do that, to pull him in to your life, to help you put those pieces of that puzzle back to where they go, okay? <clears throat> And so uh, let's keep going here and see if we can put this puzzle together, okay? Let's keep going. That Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 2. John's getting really, really close to finishing up his book here. And so these references to being the one that Jesus loved are going to begin coming at us a lot quicker now. And so this is where we're at, okay? Jesus has died on the cross. They've buried him, and all the guys are left alone, right? It's been three days now, three days since Jesus is gone. And Mary begins to head back to the tomb, okay? She's about to go give Jesus a proper burial because they couldn't give him one before, right? And so she's headed back to this tomb in order to give Jesus the burial that he deserves. But when she gets there, she finds that her mourning is not going to be what she expected it to be, okay? Instead, he's gone. His body is completely missing. Right. And so she turns around and she runs. She doesn't walk. She runs back to where two of the disciples are sitting around moping, feeling kind of sorry for themselves, not knowing what to do next. And she tells them that Jesus is gone. Well, duh, Mary, he's dead. Right. Of course he's gone. No, guys, you don't understand. His body's gone. It's not where it was. It's not in the tomb. He's missing. His body is missing. Pick up in verse 1, chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter. Here's number three, guys, okay? And to the disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. There you go. Three times now, John says, I am the one that Jesus loved, even though I'm hanging out with Peter and Peter's supposed to be the rock, right? He says, you know what? I'm the one that Jesus loves. Doesn't that kind of confuse you when you read that? Every time I read that, it just made me mad. And to be honest with you, I just, I just don't think it went over with the rest of the guys very well either, right? I, I just don't think the rest of the guys thought, you know what? I'm the one that Jesus loves. What? We all, we all are Jesus' disciples, right? Man, after John released his gospel, I would not want to be him at the next disciples' potluck dinner, right? <laughs> but hey, love him or leave him. From the perspective of someone that didn't know much about the Bible, he's not done yet, okay? He's still digging his hole. Let's go find the next one. We're going to be in the final chapter of John's book here, so that means we don't have much time to collect those last two places. We're in chapter 21. Let's take a look at verse 7. Man, guys, we're bouncing around because I'm, I'm just unpacking something, okay? So uh, chapter 21, verse 7. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He has shown himself to most of them once already, but then just kind of out of nowhere, he's disappeared again, right? He's gone. The guys, still not knowing what to do yet, they find themselves on a fishing expedition. It's the end of the night. Morning is setting in. The sun's beginning to rise over the, over the, uh, the, the lake, ocean, the sea, and, and nothing. they have nothing to show for all their work, okay? 
when out of nowhere, Jesus just appears on the shore, very casual like, hands in his robe pockets, and he yells across the lake, basically the very same thing that everybody asks a fisherman, right? He says, have you caught anything yet? The boys, frustrated because they haven't caught anything at all, yell back one simple word. No! Right? Which kind of tells me they didn't even get a nibble. I mean, any real fisherman that I know of, even though they don't catch anything, they've always got a story to share, right? Man, I had one, but I got away. Right? <laughs> it gets bigger every time. Just ask my wife. I tell that story a lot. <laughs> Anyway, Jesus yells back to him. He says, try the other side of the boat. Try the other side of the boat? Really? This is kind of comical if you ask me, to be honest with you. And if, if you didn't get it the first time, you kind of got to know the backstory, okay? To Jesus, this is more of a running joke between buddies. You see, Jesus has a pretty good sense of humor, right? Tony, Jesus has got a good sense of humor, okay? <laughs> Just, just look at me. <laughs> Jesus has a great sense of humor. But, but this isn't the first time that Jesus told him to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. Back in the very beginning, when he first met these boys, they had spent an entire night fishing without anything at all to show for it, okay? When Jesus shows up and tells them they've been fishing on the wrong side of the boat all along, right? All night long. You know, guys, you guys are fishing on the wrong side of the boat. Are you not over there? You'll be good, right? And so reluctantly... They, they let down their nets again one more time at his request in order to pull in this massive load of fish, more than they could even carry, okay? And so this request that Jesus yells across the lake this second time was pretty much a request that in all reality should have let these guys know who was on the shore, right? Okay? And so they're like, you know what, guys? We've tried everything. We have nothing to show for it. Might as well try the other side of the boat. Right? And so they throw their nets in the other side and bam! This time, man, their nets are overflowing. There's so many fish, they can't even get the nets onto the boat. And so they have to drag this net all the way across the sea back to the shore because they just can't get it. Their boat's about to capsize every time they try to pull this net in. And then out of nowhere, John here is the first one to realize what was going on. Right? John, okay? And he finally realizes who's actually behind this crazy fishing miracle. Okay? Pick up there in verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the other side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Here's number four, okay? Number four. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, wait a minute, there were 11 other guys in that boat. There were 11 other guys in that boat, right? Right? The one whom Jesus loved, right, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Dude, that's got to be Jesus yanking our chain, Peter. That's, that's got to be Jesus yanking our chain, man. He's on the shore. He's yelling at us. And then when Peter heard that, he remembered the very first time that Jesus did the very same thing that he just now did. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Evidently, Peter liked to fish naked. Look. Donald, if I invite you to go fishing with me and the first thing you do when you get on my boat is you take off your pants, we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> You're getting off the boat. Right? <laughs> I'm, sending, I'm sending you to Grandma. There you go. <clears throat> but anyways, note here four times now, John has described himself as the one whom Jesus 
loved. Okay, bear with me one more time. We're already in the last chapter. Bounce down just a little bit more to verse 20, okay? The boys here had pulled in this massive amount of fish that they had just caught, and they had just and they had just had a fresh grilled fish breakfast, which Jesus cooked, by the way. I got to stop there and tell you, I can't even imagine how good this fish dinner had to have been. This had to have been the absolute best fish dinner in the entire world. I mean, you have the creator of everything being the chef of your meal. Man, I love fish, but that has got to be some good. Anyways, after breakfast, Jesus decides it's time to let Peter know, uh, you know what, man? I don't care what you did before. I don't care that you you turned me. I don't care that you ran away. Okay? He wanted to let him know that he forgave him. Okay? And so it's time to let Peter off the hook and make sure that he knows that he still loves him. But P- Peter here, he still doesn't quite get it. Okay? Let's start reading in v- verse 15. Verse 15, okay? So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Go all the way back to the beginning, right? Jesus, I'll never turn away from you because I love you more than everybody in this room, right? Jesus, Jesus says, do you, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke of, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, here's the last one, okay? Peter, turning around, saw the disciple. Anybody want to finish that? Whom Jesus loved, okay? Following, and also had leaned on his breast at the supper. Wait a minute. And said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Notice how he kind of throws that part in. He doesn't just do it just out of, you know, here's something else. Okay. He throws it in for a reason. All right. We're going to get to that in just a second. Verse 21. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that that he remain till I come, what is that to you? He says, you Follow me. Jesus tells Peter kindly to mind his own business, right? Mind your own business. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. How many of us always worry about what everybody else is doing, right? How many many times have you invited somebody to come to church and they're like, yeah, I don't go to church because I'm I'm hypocrites down there, man. You know what? They're They're letting a hypocrite send them straight to hell. They're letting somebody, I'm not letting somebody else send me to hell. If I'm going to hell, I'm going there on my own doing right? I'm not letting somebody else send me there. But these people are let. what about this guy, right? And Jesus goes, don't worry about him. You worry about yourself, okay? He says, if you really want to follow me, your love for me may fail from time to time, right? Right? Your love for me may fail from time to time, but my love for you will never fail, will never fail. Peter still believes that he's the one that loves Jesus the most, right? I love you, right? I love you. I love you. Three times, right? I love you, Jesus. It's me. I love you, right? He's still trying to boast. He's still trying to boast about how good he is, right? But Lord, I love you more than all of these. I know I failed you once, okay? But but no one can love you more than I. I love you more than anyone. Jesus says, Peter, you're worried about the wrong thing. He says, you're worried about the wrong. He says, 
He says, I love you, Peter, right? He says, he says, but if you truly love me, like you think you do, you're going to follow me. You're going to follow me wherever. It shouldn't matter what the other guy does. It shouldn't matter what anybody else in this world does, okay? You're going to follow me. So about now, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, Tom, following Jesus, right? It's our series, right? Why are we talking about the one that Jesus loved? <laughs> What, what, what's up with that, right? And, and what's so important about John saying this about himself? And, and what's with Peter being the one that's always around when he does it? What's the deal, right? I want to go to one other place this morning. I want you to, to look at, at one person, and that person is the same person that was with John at almost every single time that he calls himself the one that Jesus loved, and that's Peter. You see, Peter, he thought of himself a whole lot differently than John. Okay, Peter's pride was in himself and his love for God. Okay, and that was the point that John was trying to get across. Uh, see, see, John called himself the one that Jesus loved, but Peter, he said he was the one that loved Jesus. Right? Do you see the stark difference in the way these two men saw themselves? Okay. See, this was one of Peter's problems. He was continually boasting about his love and his devotion to Jesus, but never once did he mention the love and devotion that Jesus had for him. He, he missed the boat completely on that. Cruise over to Luke chapter 22 for a minute. We're going to start reading in verse 1. You have to get the whole picture. So back up there, Luke chapter 22. You have to get the whole picture the way that Jesus actually describes it for us, okay? And yes, this is the first time that John begins calling himself the one that Jesus loved. Okay, Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Luke 22, 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priest and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. It's already begun. Jesus is on his way, right? He's on his way to the cross. And Satan believes he's setting the wheels in motion here. Satan believes that he's got, he's got it all under control. He's going to take care of this, right? When in reality, we all know that God's doing it, right? We all know God's in charge. So let's keep reading verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. Who did he send? Peter and John, right? Okay. Those two guys are together again. Let's keep going. Skip down to verse 21. Drop down to 21. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes it is as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it would be that did, would do this thing. Remember, this is the first time John actually refers to himself as what? The, the one that Jesus loved, right? Okay. It's because this is also the first time that Peter basically says, I would never do that. I love you more than anybody. Right? I love you more than anybody else, okay? Keep reading, verse 24. Now there was also a dispute among them. Anybody remember what the dispute was about? Who was the greatest, right? Okay. There was a dispute among them as to which of them which should be considered the greatest. You see, when you begin saying things like that, I'm the greatest. I'm the best Man, I am the best pastor there is. I don't think so. <laughs> right? But when you begin saying things like that, I love Jesus more than you. You begin thinking you're better than everyone else. Right? And so Jesus is making the point here. It isn't that you love me more than anyone else does. Rather, it's I that loves you. Okay? This should be the most important thing here. But poor Peter, he doesn't get what Jesus is trying to tell him. And here's why. Check out verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Donald, wake up. 
right? He must not have been paying attention here. I can imagine him chatting it up with his other disciple buddies, right? Poking him in the shoulder, having a good old time, or just talking, right? And, and as Jesus is talking, because Jesus has to repeat his name twice just to get his attention. Once Peter turns and he faces Jesus, right, he continues. Indeed, Peter, Satan has asked for you. I can see Peter's mouth drop to the floor about this time. Say, what, Jesus? <laughs> what? What? What are you talking about? Jesus continues, Satan has asked for you, Peter, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. And oh, Jesus, you don't have nothing to worry about. <laughs> Is that all? Right? You ain't got nothing to worry about, right? He says, man, I love you more than anybody else here. I'm good, right? I'll never leave you no matter what. Jesus has just told everyone in the room someone was going to betray him, right? Someone was going to turn their back on him, but everybody in that room, especially Peter, thinks themselves to be the greatest. Remember, they were arguing. I'm better than him. Somebody in this, I'm better than him, right? Somebody in this room is going to betray me. No, not me. I'm better than all these guys. I love him more than anybody here, right? I love Jesus more than you. No, I love... It, 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 anybody got siblings? I love mom more than you. No, I love mom more than you do. Right? Right? That's probably what old Peter was doing, right? That's probably what he was doing. There you go. There you go. That's probably what Peter was doing when Jesus had to call his name twice. Right? He's like, I love him more than you do. I'm his best. I'm the greatest, right? Jesus looks at him and goes, Simon! <laughs> right? Get his attention. Peter's so full of himself at this point, he has to tell Jesus, and everyone's sitting around the table, right? Jesus, I don't, you, you don't have nothing to worry about. I don't care what Satan wants. I'm never going to turn my back on you, no matter what. Have you ever thought that way? I'll never fall away. I'm, I'm good. I love Jesus, man. I'm good, right? Man, there's a whole lot of that going on today, isn't there? There's a whole... I don't care what Satan does to me. I love Jesus way more than you do. I'm better than you are. So I'm all good, Lord. Come on, come on. be honest. We, we've all heard it before. Yeah, I love Jesus. I'm saved. Do you go to church? No, I don't need that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't need to get. I don't. I, I'm all good, man. I'm a good Christian. I don't need to go to church. Why in the world would I need to do that? I love Jesus. Just like old Peter here in verse 33. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Don't worry, Lord. I know you said someone here would betray you, but it ain't going to be me. I love you more than anyone else here. I don't need to go to church. I'm better than all the rest of you guys. I got enough Jesus in me to withstand any storm. I'm good, right? That's the way it goes. Verse 34. Then he said, and this one actually hits home more than you'll ever know. I tell you, Tom, wait, that says Peter. <laughs> no, not Tom. It says, says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times. I'm sorry, but Lord, you've lost your mind. You've lost your mind, man. There's no way that'll ever happen to me. Do you see here the difference in how these two men treated their love for Jesus? If he would have said this to John, I kind of feel that John would have said, I'm sorry, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I am so sorry that I'm the one that did this or I was the one that was going to do I'm so sorry, Lord, please forgive me. But Peter says, no, Lord, that will never happen. I'm good. Right? My love is too strong. You see, on one hand, you have a very humble man that, that knows anything is possible in his life, Right? Even the failure of losing your faith. Even the failure... I had a phone call this weekend. I've done told you about it, right? Tom, I'm having trouble with my faith. It's really easy to lose that. It's really easy to drop by. It's really easy to lose that faith and that love and that devotion that you have for God if you don't stay on top of it. 
when you get out of church, right? When you get out of church and you just kind of like, it just starts, it's, it gets easier and easier and easier. One, one Sunday turns into three years, right? I've not even picked up my Bible. I don't know how long, right? Don't ever say you won't because it can happen. When you say things like, it'll never be me, right? That, my friend, is when Satan asks for you. That's when Satan asks for you. It'll never be me. So many people shake their heads saying, that'll never be me. I love, I love him way too much. But the fact is, just like Peter, it does happen. I don't care who you are. You can sit in the pew every single Sunday so full of yourself and say, that will never happen to me. And that's when Satan whips out his wallet and says, want to make a bet? Want to make a bet? It happens. We're all human. But thank God he's not. Thank God he's not. His love never falters. It never fails. And he will never walk away from you. You see, John knew that. He knew that Jesus loved him, right? With all of his faults and all of his failures attached, even at all the times that he fell flat on his face, Jesus never stopped loving John. Jesus will never stop loving you. He never stopped caring for him. And just because you make some mistakes, anybody in this room ain't... Never made a mistake? <laughs> Just because you make a mistake doesn't mean that he's going to stop loving you. He's always there to take you back at any time in your life. 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 verse 7 says this. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love. Play clo really close attention to this next part, okay? It says, not that we loved God. Peter, I love you, God. I love you, Jesus, right? Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. <laughs> tell you that, that hits you on the heart. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Did you catch that? In this love, it's not as much that we loved God like Peter thought. I love you. I love you. I love you. How many times can we sit in the back of the room and go, I love you, man. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Trying to convince yourself that you're a Christian. I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. Right? But it's what it's that he loved us like John knew. It's all how we see ourselves and how we see our relationship with Jesus Christ. Back to that very first question I asked. How do you see your relationship with Jesus this morning? How do you see yourself? Is it that, is all we see the fact that we love him or do we see the fact that even though we fail, even though we may walk away, even though we stumble from time to time, even though we fail to go to church on Sunday or pay our tithes or pray or whatever it is that we as fallen human beings do, down here on this earth, God still loves us. You have to keep that in mind as you begin your walk with Jesus. You will screw up. You will fall. You will cuss again. You will do things that you shouldn't do. You will screw up, but He never will. He never will, right? You see, this is how John saw himself. He saw the fact that God loved him, even in those times that he wasn't very lovable, right? So let's take a quick look uh, at the downfall of Peter and what caused all of this to happen. Why did Peter deny Jesus even when he felt deep down inside of himself that he never would? I know it's late. Sorry, 12-12. If y'all got to leave, I understand. 
Yeah, Bill ain't got a watch. We're good. <laughs> but God's not done yet. Okay? So one of the first things that I noticed about Peter here is his lack of prayer. Peter's lack of prayer. But Peter was a praying guy, right? Let's go to Luke chapter 22 real quick. I'm going to try to rush through this as much as I can, okay? So bear with me. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. I'm going to get a drink. Start reading in verse 39. Luke 22, verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Remember, he just told Peter, Satan's coming for you, right? Satan's coming for you, okay? And that he would deny him three times. Peter, Satan is coming. You're going to deny me three times. Peter must not have taken him at his word because what did Peter do instead? Drop down to verse 45. When he arose from, from prayer and, he, and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. He's trying to warn Peter yet again. Peter, it's going to get bad, man. Remember, I told you Satan has asked for you by name. You and your friends, man, you guys need to get up and pray. You need to, you need to do everything you can to help us out here. We are praying for you. You need to be praying for you. Come on, let's get it, right? You see, when Jesus told him to pay, Peter did not pray. James and John did not pray, right? They should have. Things might have turned out a little differently if they would have, right? But they didn't. Instead of praying, they slept. Have you ever? This has happened to me a couple times. Have you ever been in bed asleep and God wakes you up? He says, you need to get up and you need to pray. For somebody. And you go, oh man, I'll do it in the morning, Lord. He says, no, you need to get up and you need to pray for somebody. How many of you actually got up out of bed? I think I did once. God's telling Peter, man, you got to pray. Get up, man. Don't sleep. You need to pray. It's important. Now, after Jesus has been taken away, Peter begins his next failure, okay? It says, Peter followed, but at a distance. Look at verse 54, Luke twenty-two fifty-four. 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Now, you have to understand when people, and that's us included, every single one of us, right? When people begin to place distance between themselves and God. I was at I was out late last night. I'll go to church next week. All right? Ever said that? <laughs> I have. <laughs> right? You see that's sometimes when things start getting out of hand. That's when that's when the man that says, "I love Jesus more than all of these." Right? begins to fall just a little bit. Now, in Peter's defense, he was there, okay? He was there. That's more than I can say about all the other disciples, right? But the problem was, it was a half-hearted there, right? There are so many people like that still today. They come to church, but they're not really here, right? They're not really here. They come in as late as they can. They sit as far back as they can. They leave as quickly as they can get out of here. And while they're here, they try to grab a few more minutes of sleep that they might have missed out on the night before instead of listening to the message that God had prepared for them, even if it's a really long message like this one. <laughs> right? <clears throat> but you see, those are the kind of people that follow Christ at a distance sometimes. Sure, they come, but they never really make any commitments. They want to check in on Facebook or Instagram or, you know, whatever, you know, even like you all did this morning, coming in person, right, in real life. But that's really about it. God says, when you do things like that, y'all playing with fire. And y'all playing with fire. He says, don't follow me at a distance. I don't want you at a distance. I want you close. I want you next to me, right? Have you ever watched one of those nature programs on TV where they show a predator like a lion attacking some smaller animal, right? Let me ask you, which one of those smaller animals always gets picked off first, right? 
It's usually the one that separates himself from the rest, right? They're all moving together real nice, right? And then there's that slow one, you know? It's got a, it's got a thorn in its paw or something, right? And it gets, it gets a little slower and it gets a little slower, right? And, and they begin to fall behind the rest of the pack and the lion says, guess what? Lunch! Is that what happens? You see, when you're separated from the people of God, when you isolate yourself from worship, when you say to yourself, you know what, I'm better than everybody else. I can follow Jesus at home in bed. Then you become vulnerable. You know, I don't have to go. I don't have to, I don't have to worship in person. I'm good. Where are you right now? Where are you right now? Are you following Christ this morning, but maybe at a distance? If that is you this morning, I want you to notice it gets a whole lot worse for Peter as we see him take his next step downward. As he's following Christ, but at a distance, he makes his way to the courtyard of the high priest, right? We see that Peter goes over to the fire and he begins warming himself, right? It's a, it's a cool evening with, and he's warming himself by this fire with people that he had no business being around. No business being around. But old Peter here thought he was above falling away, right? So he thought he would just sort of slip in and kind of hang out for a little while. And he wanted to check everything out for himself. He hoped to go unnoticed in this much larger crowd. And he wanted to warm himself by the fire. But at this point, Peter might not have realized it. But he's that one that's limping in the back of the group already. He was already tired. He was already worn down. He was already vulnerable. And when he was falling behind the pack here, for all practical purposes, he had run out of ideas. Peter had no idea what to do next. He had no idea what to do, right? But as we see here, Peter was in the wrong place. And he was with the wrong people. And he was about to do the wrong thing. And our problem is we can find ourselves a lot of times in the exact same place as Peter, warming ourselves by the fire of the enemy. Are you following God but at a distance this morning? You don't want to get close because he might actually ask you, I don't know, to actually maybe change something that you don't want to change. I'm happy where I'm at. See, when you find yourself following Jesus, but at a distance, you're going to quickly find out that it becomes really easy to deny him. Okay, pick up there in verse 55. I'm trying to close in. Okay, now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them and a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him, but he denied him. Here we go, okay, saying, woman, I do not know him. And after a while, right, another saw him and said, you also are of them, number two. But Peter said, man, I am not. There you go, two failures down, right? It's getting easier for him. It's getting really easy, right? Okay. <clears throat> Twice now, the very same man that said, I love you more than all of these, right? I'll never deny you. I'll never deny you has done it twice, right? A wise man once said, what? Never say never. Amen. Right? A full hour passes before the third denial. And this just shows you that when you're compromising who you are and who Jesus are is, you're not really thinking very good, okay? A full hour passes, Okay. You know you shouldn't be where you're doing, be doing what you're doing. You know you shouldn't be in the situation that you're in, but here you are, and then you realize, man, I've been here an hour already, right? Then we come to verse 59. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. I don't know what you're saying. Immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine doing that? You've just swore on your life, you don't even know this man. 
And before you can finish your next thought, cock-a-doodle-doo, the rooster crows. You turn your head slightly to the right. And Jesus, the man that you just denied, even knowing, is looking right at you. I don't know about you, but that sends shivers up and down my spine. How do you think Jesus looked at him? The verse that says he looked at Peter could actually be translated, he looked right through him. He looked right through him. Have you ever had anybody look right through you? Let me rephrase that question. Anybody in here ever have a mom? Right? We all had a mom. Where have you been? Nowhere, mom. Look at me. Where have you been? And you start confessing stuff you never thought you'd ever confess, don't you? <laughs> right? Because they give you that mom look. Right? I can't even do it. <laughs> I know, right? That look of, I already know where you've been. I'm waiting for you to be honest with me and tell me where you're at. Growing up, I saw that look a lot. It ain't no fun. In fact, it can be quite terrifying sometimes. <laughs> right? Jesus, at this point, looked right through Peter. I don't think it was one of those mom looks that means you're in trouble. Okay? But it was more of a look of compassion and a look of love. He was telling Peter, you failed. Do you understand now? Do you get it? Your love for me just failed. But I still love you. I still love you. The one that Jesus loves. That's what this whole message is about this morning. The one that Jesus loves. And when you come to finally realize that fact, the fact it's Jesus' love for us, not our love for him, then it begins to tear at your heart. It says, Peter went out and wept bitterly. He thought he had blown it. That's it, man. I let Jesus down. Jesus was taken away. He was crucified. He was nailed to a cross. He shed his blood and he died for me. How do you see yourself this morning? Do you see yourself like Peter? That your love can hold on? That your love is strong enough for both of you? Or do you see yourself like John and realize that your love can fail, but his never will? His never will. Well, thank God for that. Praise the Lord. Simple fact is there will be times in my life when Jesus will look straight through me. There will be a lot more of them. When Jesus will look straight through me, times when I let Jesus down. I I can name four times right now this week that I let Jesus down. And he looked right through me. But he never turned his back. He never turned his back. The song says, Jesus loves me, this I know. Not, I love Jesus more than you. Right? Because when we begin to see ourselves more like Peter, 
then like John, that's when we begin to lose sight of who Jesus really is and what our relationship with him is really supposed to be like. You see, Jesus loves us with all of our faults and all of our problems and all of our doubts and all of our fears and all the junk that we have in our lives. No matter what we do, no matter where we find ourselves, Jesus is always there to pick us up when we fall down flat on our face. He's always there. That's what our relationship with Jesus is supposed to be about. It's because of his love for us. It's because because that, that, that He loves us, not because of we, our love for Him. It's not that I'm better than anyone else. It's not that I love Him any more than anyone else. But it's that He loves me. It's about our failures and His forgiveness. Did you get that? It's because of our failures and His forgiveness. Are you following the same Jesus this morning? The one that loves you no matter what? The same Jesus that is always there in our times of need? You you know, it's not just John. John, John, John wasn't being stuck on himself. It's not just John. But it's you. Each and every one of you. You are all the one that Jesus loves. And he's begging you to come to him. And and if you find that you may have slipped away from him this morning, he's begging you to come back. He's begging you to be part of your life. Let's pray. Lord, come to you this morning with our hearts wide open. Lord, I I make all kinds of mistakes in my daily life. I fail you. Yes, I do love you, but my basis of my love for you is not just because I love you, it's because you love me. You give me that opportunity to be your child, and I want to be that the best of that I could possibly be. I'm going to have a lot of problems in my life. It's never going to end. But Lord, I know you're always there for me. I want to follow you the best way that I possibly can. And the first step of that is realizing the love for you cannot be topped. It cannot be greater than your love for me is what I need in my life. You promised that love to us. And Lord, I promise that I will do everything I can for you. Lord, help us this morning as we go forward. Lord, we're going to have an invitation. And I pray that somebody here that you have spoken to their hearts this morning. In Jesus' name. I got a song. Words speak.